You are now experiencing the, 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 the digital life with Kevin Lockett. A bonus track. Okay, we're talking to filmmaker Keith Carmack, who created a, a really interesting documentary on T. Hill, who's a legendary Negro Leagues player, and the film is called Is This Heaven? How are you today? I'm very good. How are you? I'm fine. So it's interesting because I do, I do a lot of research when I'm interviewing guests. And when I was researching for this show, I think I was going to come across a baseball website with a lot of stats and baseball paraphernalia and all that stuff. But in actuality, you're a music guy. You, you played jazz guitar. You, you played in a rock band. You're a videographer. So there's a lot of arts in your life. And on your site, in the very middle of all the music and the videos, is your Kickstarter campaign for Mr. Hill. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess um, a lot of what this documentary is about is is it's not so much sports. I mean, it definitely appeals to uh, you know a sports fan, but uh, it's it's a lot more just on a human level, giving someone respect that that deserves it, and they never got it before. For people who don't know who Pete Hill is, can you tell the listeners? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Pete Hill was a Negro League baseball player. He, he, I mean, he was a pioneer. The Negro National League, which if, if even like a, a passing knowledge of, of the Negro Leagues, you've probably heard of Rube Foster, who started the, the Negro National League in about 1919-1920. But Pete Hill played uh, the prime years of his career were, were before that. So this was a lot of you know, real, real small-time little leagues and, and barnstorming games. Uh, Pete Hill would go down to Cuba in the winter to play, which is a very interesting part of his story. That You think Cuba at that time, uh, they didn't really have segregation. So Pete Hill, this African-American, is, he is one generation away from slavery. He's trying to play baseball here, and it's, it's segregated, and there's not even really much of a – of a, an established league at the time, he goes to Cuba, and he's an all-star. He, he's one of the top five guys playing in Cuba. But he eventually gets in with Rube Foster's inaugural season with his, his first team, the Chicago American Giants, and he, he becomes the captain of that team. And he, and he plays out. He had a very long career, and he was a, a player manager in the last few years of his career. And like a lot of ball players back then, died poor. Well, then that's where the story picks up, and it gets really tricky. He uh, he died in Buffalo, and we shipped back to Chicago. A lot of players from that inaugural Negro National League team uh, wanted to be shipped back to Chicago uh, because they they were just so welcomed there. And that was really where the Negro baseball really took off. Uh, so he he gets shipped back to Chicago, but no one knows where he's buried. And his story just kind of dies for, uh, I don't know, 50-some years. He, he, no one really knows what, what happened to him. Uh, he gets inducted into the Hall of Fame, and we still don't know where he is. And the cemetery that it was most likely that he would have been at uh, had a, this really weird controversy where uh, the grounds crew had dug up about over 200, maybe close to 300 graves, and resold the plot. So for a while there, we thought that Pete Hill was dug up, and his remains had been dug up, and, and the plot resold. Now, I, I don't really want to give away the end of the movie, though. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, of course. So it's interesting because I didn't know about the Cuba thing. And yeah, you, could yeah. have just did a doc, you could just make a documentary on that. But you took the story about what happened to his grave and what happened to him when he died. What made you decide to do the documentary? It was a article in the Chicago Sun Times. Uh, it just asked, is a, is a Negro League Hall of Fame player buried here? And it was about that Baroque Cemetery, and those grounds crew that dug up those graves. And to me, I was like, well, that's a documentary. But no one's probably going to tell it. So if anyone's going to do it, it's got to be me. And I just kind of had that, that once in a lifetime thing, probably. I don't, I don't know that I'll ever feel that feeling again, where I just had to drop everything that I was doing and start following this story. And I maxed out some credit cards on film equipment 
and I would just start renting a car on weekends and follow the story wherever it went. Yeah, it seems like this has turned into like a labor of love for you. Like, I mean, it's like this is your mission now to make sure this story is told. Yeah, absolutely. I just kind of had to do it. I I don't know how else to explain it. Then uh, I just felt like it needed to be done. No one else is going to do it. And uh, I, you know, I could kind of uh, uh, make sense of it in my own way and say, well, maybe this will lead to a, to a job somewhere. I had done sound design in college, and maybe if I make a whole movie on my own, that'll convince someone to let me do one thing on on a film later, and I could start a career. So that's kind of how I I hedged my bet. But it was really just a just just a feeling that I had to do it. Mm-hmm. Now, like you said, when you say you maxed out your credit cards, that reminded me of um, Robert Townsend when he made the Hollywood Shuffle, because he maxed out his credit cards to, to get his film done. And basically, your film is mostly done, but you went to Kickstarter to raise the rest of the funds so you can tie things up. Yeah, I use a few clips with stock footage, and uh, that stuff's not cheap. In some cases, it's up to about $60 a second. And even though I, I've trimmed it down as, as much as I can, I still have, I think, about $4,000 of stock footage that I need to buy, and then there's kind of finishing costs. And, and I, I really like to get into some festivals, and there's always a fee for, for entry there. So I decided to, to turn to Kickstarter and, and use it mostly as a pre-order device. You know, I, I don't want to ask for free money or anything. I... I got a poster designed, I got a t-shirt designed, and uh, and uh, a really awesome watercolor portrait of Paint Hill uh, painted, and uh, we're basically using it to pre-order the DVD, and you can you can order those other things, and hopefully uh, we'll hit the goal, and I can finish everything off and, and just ship all that stuff out to people, and we can start getting the movie out there. Yeah, and you're not really requesting a whole lot of money, it's, it's just over $6,000, and also, when it comes to rewards, you talked about them already, but a lot of times when people uh, do their rewards, they're going for maybe 10, 25, then it's like 75, 100, 1,000, 500. But you've really kept the bulk of your rewards around 25, 35. And that's, really, that's pretty cool. You kind of really kept it economical. And I can tell by the backers that I think the backers actually like the fact that they could back sell multiple things around the same price. Yeah, yeah. And, and that was done on purpose. You know, I, I know that I can go order a a bulk amount of t-shirts and when when you do that it, it's only really you know a few dollars a shirt so if i can sell them for 25 bucks you know i i can still uh raise money toward the film by doing that and it's the price of a t-shirt that he would buy at the store you know or then when you get up into the the packages you know 96 dollars you can have everything on the page. And that, that goes back to, I, I don't want free money. I just wanted to, uh, give people a way to, to buy merch and, and help out the movie at a comparable price. Uh, you know, a DVD plus soundtrack, $35. I mean, that's kind of what you would pay for a CD and a DVD. So yeah, it's, it's just kind of a way to kick off the store and, and, uh, finalize this thing. Go back to Pete Hill for a second. I think his nephew mentioned, uh, something to the fact that most people, when they think of the Negro Leagues, just think of the Josh Gibson, Satchel Page era. He said it's almost like the Negro League started at that point. And, and he's true. Like, when I think of the Negro Leagues, I go to Josh Gibson. I go to Satchel Page and, and, and towards the end of it with uh, with Jackie Robinson. But that those early periods are great stories that's kind of disappeared. Right. Uh, those are the pioneers. That's when, you know, even... The Chicago Defender was a, a black newspaper that, that kept great records of those Negro Leagues, and even the early ones, they had tried to establish uh, Negro Leagues before Groove got the Negro National Leagues going, and and the Chicago Defender really tried to put those, you know, the descriptions of the games and the stats in their paper, but uh, even with a, a few papers like that really trying to get it out there, there's not a lot of records kept. It was a lot of, they call them barnstorming games. It was just, you know, the there would be the 
the Negro League team from Philadelphia, and they're going to travel across the country, and they're going to take on whoever the team is in whatever city. Yeah, you know, it's it's how Major League Baseball started, but they kind of got, you know, the the league, Major League Baseball, going before the Negro Leagues were able to. But it was it was all about, hey, we have a team. Let's see if we're better than your team. And they were just traveling around doing that and selling tickets and, and letting the public watch and, and have a nice day out watching baseball. But the records weren't kept. The stories weren't being told. And a lot of those guys were forgot about. And uh, some of them were, hey, better than the greats that you think about, even Satchel right. and Josh Gibson and Babe Ruth and Ty Cobb. Yeah, because the Seahawks also kind of stats. Um, basically, Keith Hill was on like a five-two player. I mean, he would have been if he was allowed to play in the major leagues. He would have been on par with people like Ty Cobb because he was that talented. Yeah, absolutely. And we know now we've been been able to piece together enough to know, say with confidence, that he was a four thousand hitter. I think the major leagues have what three of those. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that's that's how good he was. And, and there's that stat. I I love throwing it out there. It's so polarizing. In 1919, Pete Hill hit 28 home runs. Babe Ruth hit 29. And that was the year that Babe Ruth really started to take off. And Pete Hill was in the twilight of his career. So, you know, we don't, we just don't know. Was Pete Hill hitting 50 home runs a year before that? <laughs> you know, because this would have been when he was tapering off his, his power. He could have been. He could have been doing those numbers that, I mean, even Babe Ruth hadn't been able to do yet. And another aspect of the documentary is the Hall of Fame itself, because once they started inducting more Negro League players into the Baseball Hall of Fame, the records were, at, at times, inaccurate. Yeah. they uh, In 2006, they had a, a special Negro Leagues committee, and they, they pulled together a bunch of researchers that were doing that Negro League research, and uh, they wanted them to just vote on players and, and say, okay, who was worthy? And they weren't going to have a cap or a minimum or anything. It's just anyone that was worthy, it would be the same thing. You'd have to get 75% to get in, and they would induct all these players. And uh, they put Pete Hill in, but they had the wrong name on the plaque, and they had his his birthplace wrong. And that was the information that they had at the time. Uh, they put him on as Joseph Hill. His his legal name is John Preston Hill. They put him in as Joseph Hill. And, you know, it, it's not the first time it, it's happened, but here you have the highest honor that you can give a person as far as baseball goes, and, and they had the, the name on his plaque wrong, and they had information about his background wrong. They just, they just didn't know that much about him. In the movie, we start that process, and I got to say, it's, it's not really me. It's those researchers were the ones digging and, and correcting that information. But uh, I, I was right there. I was able to follow along with that story and, and get that stuff on film uh, with them correcting those mistakes and correcting the plaque, ultimately. But uh, that's just kind of, that's how it is with that Negro League research. Uh, they think they, they've got something figured out. They have some information in front of them that they believe to be right, but you keep digging at it, and and there's more there. And, you know, maybe you're wrong, but it's not so much who's wrong or right, but it's just there's there's more to tell there. And, uh, you know, we, we need to to always be mindful to keep working on that history and, and learn that history, and more importantly, to retell it because we'll lose it again. Well, Keith Carmack, thank you for the conversation. If people want to learn more about Is This Heaven and P. Hill, where can they go? Right now, it kind of sucks. Kickstarter doesn't give you a uh, a nice, clean website to go to. So go to kickstarter.com and search for Is This Heaven. It should be the first thing that pops up. And outside of Pete, but what have you gained from this whole experience? Well, just that, uh, the experience. Some of the funnest times of my life have been just driving around looking for this story, just following this thing around. Uh, you know, I had a day job there and I was, I would get off work on Friday and I would rent a car and drive through the night, you know, and go over to, I'm from Chicago and I'd go over to Culpeper, Virginia, where he's from and I'd get an interview and I'd, I'd sleep in a parking lot in the car and I'd, and I'd come back and, 
got no sleep all weekend and then go into work on Monday morning. And uh, I could be happier. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm, I'm like delirious. <laughs> I could barely keep going and get through work on Monday, but uh, it, it's just so much fun going out there and doing that, doing something that uh, a lot of people just would not, I mean, maybe they're just smarter than me, so that's why they wouldn't do it. But, but uh, it's, it's something very illogical to just pick up and go chase down a story all over the country and make a movie by yourself. So that's probably the biggest thing that I got out of just the experience doing something that not just anyone can do. You could really take something to dig down and do this. And that was just immeasurably fun. Well, I don't think people are smarter than you. I, I think you found something that, that you care about and you're passionate about and you're doing everything you can to complete it. And I think if more people had that same attitude, I think we might be a better place. Right on. All right. Thanks a lot, Keith. Thank you. The Digital Life with Kevin Lockett. 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 Lockett.